Well, happy Tuesday, stayers. I will give everybody some time to jump on. I did give us a little bit of a heads up that I was going to be coming on here today to do a live. It's good to see you guys. It's been a minute since I have done a live. I have the opportunity to be in Hawaii doing some ministry there at the islands. It's a beautiful space. So aloha to all the uh, stayer family in Hawaii. I got in last night about three o'clock in the morning, so I'm still on Hawaiian time. Um, but it is 6.30 here Eastern, and I am really excited just to have this conversation with you guys. Um, I know that in the last 24 hours that it has been been a whirlwind of activity in the social media um, spectrum concerning everything that we saw with Mark Driscoll and the uh, church that had the uh, men's conference that had some questionable activity going on. And here's just what I want you all to know is that there is something happening in the spirit. And I use these black boxes and now blue boxes to have these conversations. And I usually talk about things that happen in our churches. That's what Raise the Stay is about, is talking about things that are happening in the local church, primarily here in the States. Um, I talk about church culture. I talk about how we as Christians need to be behaving. Um, the things I've learned are honestly through my own 20 years of being a pastor's kid and then 20 years going into full-time ministry. So that's 44 years, you guys, of being in the church. And so I may not have a lot of relationship with you, personally, but I hope that you'll trust my heart in saying that I'm for the church. I am for pastors. I am for you. I am for the abused. I am for all of us. I am not against anyone. And when I post difficult conversations, it is not to be divisive. It is not to have clickbait. It is not to try and go viral, but it is because the Lord, as much as I wish this wasn't my place in the kingdom, has asked me to to do this ministry of being raised to stay. What does being raised to stay mean? It is talking about being connected to the vine, by being connected to Jesus. And so when I talk about being raised to stay, this is John 15. This is if we abide in him, that he will abide in us. And as a result of this abiding, no matter how many times church fails us, no matter how many times people fail us, that Jesus will remain in us. And as he remains in us, then we will produce good fruit. What is that good fruit? We talk about this um, in Galatians. It's peace, love, gentleness, self-control. Even on social media stayers, we've got to have self-control. And what I'm witnessing from Christians right now are a bunch of Christians who are counterfeit connecting to things that look good, that look holy, but they are not Jesus. How do I know this? Because our fruit is putrid. What is that fruit right now that I am seeing? I am seeing bitter soil that many of us have chosen to stay in rather than to uproot ourselves out of it and begin to get into healthy community where we can be held accountable, where we can be taught how to connect to the vine and how to love each other even when we disagree. Now, I don't wanna talk about what happened with, with Mark Driscoll and that situation. I'm done talking about that. The prophetic warning that the Lord gave me specifically for this raised to stay community, and I think it's important that I deliver this word. Some of you get frustrated with me and I see it in the comments, oh, she thinks she's a prophet. No, I don't think I'm a prophet. There have been people in prophetic offices who have said and spoken over me that I have a prophetic voice. What is my job with a prophetic voice? It is declare the word of the Lord. I have the word of the Lord here with me. You'll notice even when I write the black boxes, even when I'm writing the blue boxes, Many times I attach scriptures to what the Lord is giving to me because I am not here to spew hot takes. I am not here to talk about just relevant Christian topics to get you to follow me, but to deliver the word of the Lord. That is my job in the kingdom. Is it prophetic? Sometimes. Am I a prophet? I don't know. Did I choose this? Absolutely not. Trust me. I was much happier when I was, you know, a, a gym teacher and could just live my life normal and didn't have crazy Christians screaming at me all the time. But here's the reason why I do this, because I do believe that the Lord has given me a word for the church in this time for such a time as this. And if you don't like it, you can go. There is an unfollow button and I encourage you to use the gift of the unfollow button. 
but I am not changing. I am not afraid of you. I am not afraid of man. I have been in this too long to let people scare me. What I am afraid of is what is going to happen in the end times if the church does not heed the prophetic warnings that are going out through the modern day prophets. You don't have to like someone for them to be a prophet. You don't have to like them for them to be a prophet. You don't have to approve of them. What I want to talk about is the unforgiveness, the inability to forgive people in the church right now that is skewing our ability to have discernment to know when the enemy is coming and when people have become our enemy. And what has happened in the church is we are seeing people as the enemy rather than the enemy as the enemy. And you're coming after each other when there's a real enemy that's out to kill, steal, and destroy. And you'd rather see Mark Driscoll on a stake than you would to see the, the real enemy exposed. And that is what I am talking about in the word of God right now. And here's where I'm going to take us. If you have your Bibles, I want you to come with me. And I don't ever want to be accused for not using scriptures to back up what the Lord has given me because I absolutely will use scriptures to give feedback context to what the Lord is saying to me. And you know what? If I didn't think half of you would run, I'd speak in tongues right now because that is how powerful the Holy Spirit is on me to deliver this word. And so if you're with me, stay with me. But again, you can unfollow anytime. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Please unfollow. Excuse me. If this is not for you. So we're going to be in Matthew five and I want to go to 22 and I want you to sit with me in this space. Jesus, he says this, you have heard that it is said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, we're going to keep going here, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, we'll unpack that word in a minute is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Here's what I want to say to each and every single one of us listening under the sound of my voice. Our inability to forgive leaders who have fallen, AKA Mark Driscoll, AKA anybody fill in the blank of a leader, pastor, Christian, whoever, who has failed us, our inability to forgive them, to cry raka, which is what was happening in my comment section last night. You were so focused on what Mark Driscoll has done that you could not see the very Jezebel spirit that was in the room, whether you would think it was stripping or not, there was a spirit in the room that was not of the Lord. We were more concerned about Mark Driscoll than we were about the very enemy that was in the midst of the church who is not just in that church, but that is in churches across the United States and around the world that we couldn't see the enemy for what he was. This word raka means contempt, stupid, foolishness. Jesus is saying anyone who says this about a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. I know there's church hurt. I know there are sheep who are wounded by shepherds. And I know Mark Driscoll did some bad things. I'm not saying he didn't. What I am saying is that you don't have to like a prophet of the Lord. You don't have to like his past his history, what he's done, what reports he's been on, who's against him, who said he's disqualified for him to stand up in a room and to call out the Jezebel spirit. I don't care what he did. And he doesn't have to come to your house and publicly repent for anything for you to believe that he actually has a repentive heart. God forbid that any of us, any of us have our sins put on a public square and that people demand for us to come to their home and publicly repent to them. So many of you are so offended by secondhand offense that you are being so angry at a man who did nothing to you. You only know the reports of what has been said that when the real enemy came into a church and literally went in and violated men, our husbands, our brothers, our sons, that all you could focus on was the falling of a man that you couldn't even see past that to hear the, the rebuke that was happening. And you guys, I feel it so far in my bones because if our church, if we do not repent, if we do not look at people and say, look, I'm going to forgive you. I'm not going to raise Raka. 
raka against another brother or sister, but I'm going to forgive you because God has forgiven me and I am to give as freely as I have received. That's in the word. I'm going to give as freely as I have received. Then we will be subject to judgment as it says here in Matthew 5:22. I am telling you right now that you are following people, you are supporting people, you are listening to worship music, and those men, they are cheating on their wives. They are alcoholics. They are drug addicts. And you are supporting them by, by you know, listening to their music and buying their books, and you're doing it because you're ignorant. You haven't been told of their sin, but they're still in sin. And just because somebody's sin has been exposed or their leadership has been dangerous and they are under some sort of a review does not mean that all of us have fallen short and have sinned against the glory of God. And we are now in comment section so focused on one man's fall that we will literally turn on each other and cry raka in the comment section of a social media post and make people feel like complete idiots because they don't agree with the way that we agree or we think that you know we have some sort of inside scoop on who's fallen and who should be redeemed and who shouldn't be redeemed when God will use a donkey and you better be glad of that because he's using some of you and he's using me. And if he'll use you and he'll use me and our hidden sin that we have so craftily hidden because we don't have a social media following of 200,000 and we're not leading a church that's in the news, then he will use anyone and he will use a donkey to call out the Jezebel spirit, whether you like that person or not. Now, listen, again, I am not defending Mark Driscoll. That post was not to defend Mark Driscoll. The point of that post was to tell us all that we are being distracted by things like unforgiveness. I'm in 522, Matthew 522 right now. And when we start this thing where we decide who's qualified and who should be disqualified and we begin to cry raka against each other, we are subject to the final judgment and the hell fire. Read Matthew 5, 22 if you want to read more about this. He says this, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer, offer your gift. We are offering our gifts out of impurity when we go in and we offer our gifts in worship, but we are calling Raka against Mark Driscoll. We are calling Raka against other pastors who have let us down. We are calling Raka against our brothers and sisters. And I am telling you right now, I understand that there are things that have happened in the church that should not have happened. Do I think that there are some people who should not be qualified for ministry? Absolutely. But we keep giving them platforms. And so if we're going to continue giving them platforms, then we don't get to decide if somebody's qualified or not. The Lord is clearly giving them a platform and we don't get to decide if somebody should be able to speak or not speak. And I know some of you are hurt by Mark Driscoll's ministry. I know some of you are counseling people who were hurt by Mark Driscoll's ministry, but God God is still using Mark Driscoll and it blows our minds. I know it, but he is still using people who are sinners because that is what God does because you and I, you and I are sinners and he is still using us. My point of saying this is this, the word tells us in Matthew 5, 25, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. We are murdering people with our thoughts. We are murdering people with our inability to forgive. We are murdering people with our inability to say, look, I'm going to hand them over to God. What they did was wrong. How they treated their people is wrong. The abuse is wrong. And I know that there were people who were hurt in Mars Hill. I know there were people who were hurt at Mars Hill, but for whatever reason, God is continuing to use Mark Driscoll and he will continue to use you in your pain, but you have got to stop living a life of unforgiveness. You've got to stop living to watch people fall and fail and have their ministries taken away because you don't agree with something that they did or said. And you have a little bit of context. Most of us have a little bit of context. I'm in Matthew 5, 22, and I'm going to say, this again. If anyone is angry with a brother or sister, you will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, which means stupid, foolishness, unforgiveness, 
is answerable to the court and anyone who says fool you fool will be in danger to the fire of hell here's what i'm telling you jesus took the physical act of murder and he brought it down into our own thoughts we are under the same judgment for physical murder as we are for emotional murder spiritual murder if Jesus, somebody saying, what would Jesus have done if he was in the audience? He certainly would have not made that poor man feel like he was, he was guilty for participating. It was bad shepherding of the pastor to put a new believer in that situation to begin with. And what we have to understand is that Jesus never rebuked past leaders. He rebuked the Pharisees. He rebuked those who were against his message, but we're doing more than Jesus ever did in rebuking people and making them feel like idiots. We have done so much damage in the body of Christ because we aren't able to do the work that Jesus did for us, which is forgive. So what is the prophetic word? The Holy Spirit fell into the upper room in the second chapter of Acts because of several factors. Number one, the disciples agreed they were in this for good, that no matter what happened to them, they weren't going to quit. Okay. The second thing that happened is that when everybody was gathered in the upper room, when we came into the upper room, there was a spirit of reconciliation. There was a spirit of revival. There was a spirit of forgiveness. Okay. So what happens in that situation is that the Holy Spirit fell in a room where there were people saying, we want to forgive. We want to be baptized. We want to know this message of Jesus. Without reconciliation, without repentance, without those things, we will not get revival. Now, somebody just said, girl, you're all up in your flesh. You need to get into the spirit. Oh, honey, I know that I'm in the spirit. And here's what I know is that my spirit is up against your spirit right now. And whenever the spirit of truth edges up against that spirit of the Pharisee, there's going to be some conflict. And so I would say, quite frankly, you just need to unfollow me and move on and live that life that you need to lead. But I'm telling you right now that I am in the word. I am in the word and I'm telling you right now that if we do not get our act together, that we as the church will not see the revival that is coming. We will not see the revival that is coming because we are so caught up in our unforgiveness. We are so caught up in our inability to see past people that we can't see the very enemy that is in front of us. It says here to settle your matters quickly. We may never get the apology from Mark Driscoll that we think we're going to get. You may never get the apology from your abuser. You may never get your apology that you think that you should get. But guess what? Jesus came to give us forgiveness. He came to give us grace. He came to give us mercy. And let me tell you, the scriptures tell us that we are to give as freely as we have received. And so when you come into my comment section and you are more focused on the people being the enemy and not the enemy being the enemy, that is when my spirit rises up against your spirit. The people that are coming into my comment section and causing division, it is because they are not walking in the spirit. They are not connected to that vine like we talked about in um, that John 15. They're connected to counterfeit connections, celebrity culture, the need for justice. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, not ours. Vengeance is not for us. Okay. And when I see people come into the comment sections and they hurt each other, that is when I will pull a post down because you didn't sign up for this. This is something that I signed up for. Again, I'm in Matthew 5, 22. And here's what I want to say to everybody. And I know you guys are like, don't talk to your, um, the negative comments. And you guys listen, I will address some of those, um, comments. Um, because I do think that people have been given a microphone when they need to be sat down and social media, Social media has made people think that they have influence when really they're just clanging symbols. And I want you to know when I posted that post last night that it wasn't about Mark Driscoll. It wasn't about defending abusers. It wasn't about that. That's what people made it about because that's the spirit of offense that rests on the church. And so here's what I want to say. If you have unforgiveness in your heart for anyone, Mark Driscoll, your own pastor, a worship leader, a youth pastor, a friend, you need to turn them over to the Lord and release them in the name of Jesus. You have to. Because you will not receive the revival in your heart that you have been praying for until you forgive. The word is clear. If we do not forgive, we will not be forgiven. Jesus himself says that. If we do not forgive, we will not be forgiven. Does that mean we have to trust people again? No. Does it mean that we have to let people back into our lives? No. But we do have to forgive, whether you want to, 70 times 7. And so when we forgive, we are forgiven, and then we can operate 
in the freedom of the ministry that we have been called to. I can only do this ministry raised to stay because I've handed over the people who hurt me. I carry no unforgiveness. And when I speak with power and authority, it's not out of anger. It's out of passion to see people set free. It's out of passion to see the church be exactly who we are called to be. And when we see brother rise against brother and sister against sister, these are times of the end times. These are signs of the end times. And we should be so burdened and so frustrated spiritually by the things that we are seeing that the enemy is using, that we become more grieved by that than the sin of another brother when our sin is equally as ugly. And I said this earlier, nobody needs to come to your house and before you confess their sin. Is it important, Matthew 18, if it happens between brother to brother? Sure. But everything that happens between us and our forgiveness is between us and the Father. And it is vital that we don't hold people to a standard that we ourselves are not willing to live. And so what you demand from Mark Driscoll, you should demand of yourself. What you demand from the pastors abusing people that we all say, look, we've abused people, right? It's horrible when a shepherd does it, but none of us are without sin. And so I just want you to know that that post that I posted last night, if you didn't see it, don't worry about it. It had nothing to do with the event. It had nothing to do with Mark Driscoll. But yet that is what... Christians chose to turn to was the crucifixion of a man. And that is why we will not get revival in America's church. If we cannot release people back into the power of the Holy spirit, release them back to their creator to deal with them in a way that he promises to deal with those who hurt God's people, who hurt God's church, who hurt God's children. There is a judgment day coming for those people, but that judgment is not coming from you and I. And if we cast judgment in the way that I have seen the church cast judgment, we are subjected to hell ourselves. Your unforgiveness will send you to hell before anyone else is getting sent to hell because they did something that you don't like. And I am not willing. I am not willing to live that life. I will not go to hell because I cannot forgive someone. And if you don't know if that's biblical or not, you need to get your Bible out and you need right here to get in it and to read what God says about what happens when we do not forgive. That is the warning to the church. Church, we must forgive. We must repent if we are going to see a revival in these end times. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit will pass over us and we will not see the goodness of God in the land of the living because we are so caught up looking at other people's sin that we couldn't even see the one in our own eye. And I know some of you don't like this. I know some of you will unfollow me. And as I say, peace out because I am not here to be liked, but we do not need to keep on talking about something that happened forever ago. Let the enemy be the enemy. We need to focus on him and let God deal with those people. Somebody said here, it's that me, but we shouldn't give him platforms. I agree with you a hundred percent. And yet we are. And so we have no control over that. Like I said, many of you are supporting musicians and authors and speakers right now, and they're having affairs on their spouses. They're drug addicted. They're addicted to alcohol and you support them because that sin is hidden. But you don't know ignorance is bliss, right? And we're giving those people platforms on holy ground and calling them anointed. You don't know what anyone is doing. That is why you have to look inward. You and I have no control over who gets on a master platform. We have no control who gets to speak at a men's conference. We have no control over who gets to speak at a pastor's conference. We have no control over that, but we do have control over who we forgive, how we forgive and how we speak about God's people. I know you guys don't like the scripture, touch not God's anointed winds, but I mean this. I'm not getting to heaven and being told that I was raising a hand against another man. I'm not. You may want to. I'm not. I got enough things I got to deal with when I get to heaven with my own sin. I'm not adding one more. And so I understand that some of you don't think Mark Driscoll should have a platform. Maybe I don't either, but it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what you think. Mind your own business. Deal with your own sin. Get your affairs in order. Get your house in order. Somebody said our gifts are without repentance. I'm telling you right now, you guys, when I say God will use a donkey, how do I know that? Because he uses me. He uses me. He uses you. 
And somebody says here, we have control under who we sit under and subscribe to. Absolutely. If you don't want to follow Mark Driscoll, don't. If you don't want to go to conferences where he's speaking, don't. There's a lot of people I choose not to sit under. There's a lot of people that I choose not to listen to because I don't agree with their platform. But do I block them? Do I cancel them? Do I go on social media and blast them? No. Do I hope for their demise? Do I hope for their fall? No. We are not to hope for anyone's demise or fall, but to pray that God brings them restoration. Somebody wrote here, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Absolutely. And again, God will use a donkey to call out the Jezebel spirit if we are not willing to do it. And so you know what? There were 8,000 men in that sanctuary who could have stood up and said, this is not okay. And nobody did. He used Mark Driscoll. And you don't get to like that. And I don't have to like that for it to be true. And so guys, I'm telling you, if you weren't following with me, I've been in Matthew 5, 22. That's what I have to say. The prophetic word is simple. Give as freely as you have received. If we as a church do not repent, we will not see revival. And if we do not reconcile to one another and to the father, we will not have revival. Go to Acts chapter one and two, see what was happening in the upper room for the Holy Spirit to fall on that room. The Holy Spirit will not fall on a house that is not repentive, that is not forgiving, and that chooses division over unity. The Holy Spirit is only drawn to unity. How do we forgive? 70 times seven. Every day I wake up and I say, I forgive them. They hurt me. They broke me. They crushed my spirit. This person did this to me. God, you were there. You were there when they did it. Forgive them. Forgive them. I bless them. And even when you don't mean it, even when you don't mean it, you have to keep saying it. How, you know, what do we do when people are intentionally twisting God's word? This is why we have to be wise as serpents and why we have to be gentle as doves. Here's what I want to read from Jesus here in Matthew 10. He says this. He says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Okay, this is us, you guys. He's telling this to the disciples, but this is us too. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. We have to have discernment, you guys, to know when scripture is being, you know, twisted, when scripture is not coming from the right place. And we have to get up and we have to get out. Okay, this is when we get permission to leave, right? And not stay. He says this, be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when, not if, when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. I want to tell you right now, guys, this is what's happening in my life. I get flogged every day. I get drugged into public squares on social media every day, but I cannot be afraid of people. I cannot be afraid of what people think about me because the Holy Spirit is giving me his word to speak over his church and give warning that if we do not repent, if we do not forgive, we will miss we will miss what God is doing in his church. I just read out of Matthew 10 verses 16 through 18. This is all supposed to happen, you guys. This is the, um, this is the end times. Will we see it in our lifetime? I don't know. But what I do know is that we are here and we have a choice. We can live not forgiving or we can live forgiving. We can live being angry or we can live in joy. We can live and hoping for other people to fall or we can rise up and call them blessed and, and know that we too are sinful and sinners and God still chooses to use us. I am begging you to forgive those who have hurt you. I am asking you to release those who have hurt you, to get in your word, to study the word, to not question everyone who says something that you don't like. Somebody says here, and this is kind of a moot point, but who do you think was out of line, both or one? I think that it was both. I think it can be both true. I don't think that we need theatrics in the church, and I also think that we need to honor the houses that we're serving. And we saw how they came together at the end, and of course that's not being shown on social media, and they reconciled on the platform. That is the beauty of what happened. There were people saved in that gathering. There were people, because God will use anything. He will use anything to draw people to himself. But of course, we're not talking about that. And that's what I, I would hope for, is that when we see things like this come into the light, that we don't immediately go and start accusing people of things, but we start to really look inward and say, why does this bother me? Why am I having a hard time? What's going on, you know? And so just hear me when I say this, you guys, I love you all. 
and you know, you don't have to be here. Do I think that I have a gift of prophecy? Yes. Do I call myself a prophet? No, but other people have. And I've stood on platforms and had people say publicly that I'm a prophet and that's terrifying because trust me, I'd like to be anything but. But I have no choice but to speak what the Lord gives us, um, gives me in my quiet time and my sleep and my prayers. And so I'm telling you right now that if you don't do anything in the next 24 hours, I want you to start to ask the Lord to teach you how to forgive. And if Mark Driscoll is the thing keeping you from living your best life, that sounds like something the enemy's got a hold on you. Because Mark Driscoll's not thinking about you. Release them. Release them. Release those who have hurt you. Get back on mission. Get back on mission. Get back onto the Great Commission. Stop being worried about what the left hand's doing. Focus on what you're doing. And then... Then, as the gospel goes out, as it tells us in Acts, then the end will come. But we've got to stay on mission. And if for unforgiveness is what's keeping you from being able to be connected to the vine, I just want to encourage you, get on your knees tonight and write down a list of people that you've been harboring unforgiveness over. And let me tell you what's going to happen. You're not just going to find freedom spiritually. I think some of you are going to be healed physically. I think some of you have been having intestinal issues. Some of you have been having literally physical sickness and it's because you have been living a life of unforgiveness and I am telling you when you release people man powerful things happen and I know that forgiveness is hard but God did it he did it he showed us Jesus modeled to us how to do it and I love in Hebrews when it says when we find ourselves flagging go back to how Jesus did it and model that verse by verse. That is how we know how to forgive as we do it how Jesus did it. Forgive them for they know not what they do. Okay. Somebody did ask, what in the heck did Mark do to keep someone from living their best life? I actually have that question too. He hurt a lot of people. He was a wounded shepherd who hurt a lot of people and it was bad. It was bad leadership and he was disqualified on a lot of spectrums, a lot of platforms, and yet he's still being used. I am not diminishing the hurt the man caused. I'm not diminishing the abuse and I am certainly not condoning it. What I am saying is that he has to work out his own salvation just like you and I have to work out our own salvation. And based off the comment section, there are a lot of people who have their focus on Mark Driscoll and not on the real enemy. And my post last night that I did take down was more so calling out people who were more fixated on the people than they were the enemy. And what I am telling you is the enemy is the enemy and we have got to stop making each other the enemy and unforgiveness will keep us from revival the word I want you to keep with you now is this give as freely as you have received Jesus's words give as freely as you have received somebody said he doesn't have to say sorry for me to forgive people may never say they're sorry you guys you may never get it write a letter you'll never send Forgive them in the letter. Put it in an envelope and then tear it up and burn it, okay? You have to understand that if we do not forgive, we will not be forgiven. And that is where we have got to keep on keeping our eyes on Jesus. Somebody says, if you still want to have a conversation with someone with apologies to reconcile, does that mean there's unforgiveness? Or can you forgive and still desire a conversation? Oh my goodness, you guys, yes. Man, there's so many people in my life that I have had to forgive and I know I'm never going to get the conversation, but there are days I think about them. There are days that I think, man, I actually miss them in my life, but I can't trust them again. And you guys, that's a hard place to be because having that conversation could open old wounds. It could cause pain. I get it. Um, And yeah, there is a longing for not just the forgiveness, but the reconciliation. I, I feel that, you know. Um, and, and I know when you've been slandered and gossiped against, and there have been things that have been said that have tainted your reputation and hurt your family. The last thing you want is to forgive. So that's like the last thing, because that's like the last piece of control that we have that that person took from us. But again, model how Jesus did it. Model how Jesus did it. Forgive them for they know not what they do. And we think, yes, they know what they do. We know what they're doing. 
forgive them for they know not what they do. And we have to trust that God will restore our reputation. God will restore what the enemy tried to take. But we are not in control. And I think that so many of us, that our problem is that we think we have control. And this is a true laying down of the flesh is when we lay down the, unfor the unforgiveness, we lay down the people, and we walk in the forgiveness that God has called us to. But I am going to tell you right now that the world is watching how we're responding to things. And we look a little crazy. They're watching how we're handling things that are happening in the church. And they're watching how we speak to each other. They're watching for the fruit. And they don't care how gifted we are. They don't care how gifted we are. They want to know if we have the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the gifts of the Spirit. Somebody says, I'm so confused. I don't understand how what happened relates to forgiveness. Okay. When I posted last night about that incident, I posted that this was not about Mark and it wasn't about John. And everybody lost their ever-loving minds because they're so angry at Mark Driscoll. And what the Lord showed me through that post was that more people were fixated on seeing Mark Driscoll go down. So angry at what he did. And he did... He, he was not a good leader that they could not focus on what was happening in the room that the enemy was trying to use to create chaos and confusion. And they were more fixated on Mark and him calling out the Jezebel spirit than the fact that the Jezebel spirit was actually in the room. This is the trick of the enemy. The trick of the enemy is to get us so focused on being angry with each other and being angry with situations that we cannot detect when he is actually moving in the room. And if we're walking into churches and we are so focused on who hurt us, who hurt our friends, if we're carrying offense or even secondary offense, we will be caught off guard, which is why in the scriptures when Jesus says that we are to be wise, sorry, <laughs> wise as serpents and gentle as doves. That is why, because we have to understand when we are fighting against flesh and blood and we need to stop doing that and start really fighting against the real evil one, the rulers and the principalities of the darkness. And so I'm going to leave us on that. You guys, this has been a really long live, but thank you for being here with me. I will repost this. Um, again, if you don't like me, oh my goodness, please go. Like, I don't want to cause anybody to like, you know, feel like you're following someone that you can't trust. I, I'm okay if you don't want to be here. But what I am saying is that there are prophets that the Lord is sending out into the world. Am I one? I guess we'll have to find out when I get to heaven. I don't know. But what I do know is that I have to be obedient to release what the Lord gives me. And you don't have to like it for it to be from the Lord. And you don't have to like it to make it true. I'm just being obedient to what the Lord has asked me to say. And I'm going to get it wrong sometimes. And I'm going to say things you don't like. And I'm going to be flesh fleshy sometimes. I'm not going to do it perfect, but here's what I know is that I am on guard in my own spirit all the time against the attacks of the enemy who is trying to get me to fail, who's trying to get me to say or do something that's going to get me canceled because he hates this message. And so I am constantly in the word. I am constantly praying. I am constantly seeking the Lord and asking him for his words. And you don't have to trust that. You don't even have to like it, but I would just say this, just be kind in the comment section, realize that everything can be screenshot that your words have power of life and death. And when I think of people that have hurt me, I want to think of them in the way that God sees them, not in the way that my uh, flesh feels about them. And so when I post something and your spirit rises up against it before you attack it, ask the Lord, why is my spirit responding this way? And it could be because it's not condemnation, but it's conviction that the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you something. And remember, accountability is not church hurt. And iron sharpening iron is not church hurt. This is the family of God being the family of God. And sometimes we don't know we're not connected to the true vine until we see somebody else connected to the vine and we covet their fruits. And all I'm asking is for the people of God to be fruit bearing people. Again, I don't care if you speak in tongues, if you're mean in English, that's just my reality. And honestly, I'd rather follow a Mark Driscoll sometimes than I would half of the overly spiritual elite in this group that bring their Pharisee in and make other people feel like crap. And that's just reality. So again, you don't have to like it. You can just unfollow, but understand that I'm here for us and I'm for the church and I'm for the Lord. And, um, I will get to heaven and be held accountable for every word said and unsaid. And maybe that's not your calling, but it is mine. And, um, it's heavy. It's heavy, you guys. And so that's why I take some things down because I don't want to see people get just dis dis destroyed in the comment sections. And honestly, I don't want to be destroyed. I'm a human. I have feelings. 
and I don't want to have curses spoken over me. And there have been a lot of curses spoken over me. Um, but I want to see revival more than I want to see revenge. And so I will keep speaking the things that God gives me because I believe revival is coming and I want to be in that room. I want to be in the word. Um, I want to be in a, in a church that's full of revival, not full of revenge. So I love you guys. I will repost this. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for being with me since 2019, many of you. And um, I pray that this safe space here is one that you can constantly come to for encouragement. Um, the Jezebel spirit is a live and well in the church. And the good news is God has come. Jesus came to overcome it. He will overcome the world. And we are not victims. We walk in victory. So let's go. Let's do it. I love you all. Peace.